Hello, this is a video on two famous poems by Lord Alfred Tennyson, The Lotus Eaters and Ulysses. I will first talk about Alfred Tennyson himself. This is one of the photographs that we have of Tennyson. Tennyson was born at Lincolnshire in uh, England. Uh, in 1809 and he was the fourth of 12 children of a clergyman. His father had quarreled with his brother uh, over some inheritance and there were many family feuds and problems. Not only that, in the family there was uh, chronic depression and uh, nervous disorders. One of his brothers was an alcoholic, another had to be confined to a mental institution. All this depression and uh, trauma in the family made Tennyson a pessimist. He had a lifelong uh, fear of mental illness also as evident in his uh, poetry. It was with his brother Charles that Tennyson published his uh, first poems. It was in the book Poems by Two Brothers. And uh, then Tennyson went to Trinity College, Cambridge famously, where he won the Chancellor's Gold Medal for Timbuktu. With his father's uh, encouragement, he had uh, enrolled for the competition and he got the gold medal. He had very few friends, but he was part of the Cambridge Conversation Society and uh, the Cambridge Apostles. And he made uh, some very important friendships there. The first major collection of Tennyson's poems was uh, Poems Chiefly Lyrical. All these are very famous uh, details of his life. I hope you know that already. And at this time, his father died and Tennyson had to leave Cambridge without taking a degree. And uh, he had a lifelong friend, Arthur Henry Hallam, with whom uh, his sister, Tennyson's sister, had got uh, engaged. And uh, Hallam and Tennyson went to the Pyrenees in uh, Spain border to make some money, but they did not make money. Tennyson was writing poetry at this time. And there was a major collection that came in 1832 called Poems 1832. And this collection was severely attacked by critics. Critics who attacked Keats attacked Tennyson also and called Tennyson also part of the Cockney school. And Tennyson was very sad about all this. He was very upset. Already he was depressed and pessimistic. And you know what happened? He resolved never to publish again. And uh, for 10 years, he kept quiet without publishing. But at this time, when Hallam died, he started writing uh, some elegies. Uh, other poems also he wrote at this time. And uh, uh, then uh, after 17 years only, the collection of elegies, 132 elegies in all he wrote. And the collection of elegies was published as In Memoriam after 17 years only. At this time, Tennyson... Uh, fell in love with Emily Selwood, who was actually the sister of his uh, brother's wife. And uh, this engagement did not lead to marriage straight away. Uh, there was a, it was a long and interrupted engagement. And Tennyson at this time uh, was encouraged by his friends to publish. And after 10 years of silence, he published in 1842 a collection called Poems. That established his reputation as a poet and he became famous and uh, accepted. However, he had financial problems. He, this collection did not bring him much money. At this time, he wrote a very major poem called The uh, Princess. That was in 1847, same year as the publication of Jane Eyre, Wuthering Heights, Vanity Fair, etc. And uh, this uh, poem, The Princess, uh, which shows a very mutinously rebellious princess at the head of a ladies' academy. It was turned into an opera by Gilbert and Sullivan, uh, a satirical opera called Princess Aida. It was in 1850 that finally Tennyson's problems all got resolved. He married Emily Selwood and he uh, got to publish in memoriam. And also at the death of Wordsworth, William Wordsworth, he succeeded Wordsworth as poet laureate in 1850. And at this, after he became poet laureate, he uh, actually uh, resi uh, sorry, retired to Isle of Wight and stayed there uh, away from limelight. And he wrote a number of brilliant poems at this time. All these poems were loved by uh, Queen Victoria. Starting from In Memoriam, Queen Victoria uh, admired Tennyson a lot. He wrote at this time Maud and other poems, Idols of the King and uh, also a lot of poetic plays.
It is in the later career that he began writing poetic plays. Queen Mary, Harold, The Falcon, etc., The Cup, etc. are important poetic plays of this time. And uh, Tennyson finally died in 1892. Uh, somewhere in 1890, uh, Thomas Alva Edison encouraged the Tennyson, uh, asked him, requested him to record some of his poems in his own, own uh, voice. So Tennyson's poem has been, poems have been recorded uh, in his own voice. So we have Tennyson's voice and also uh, some three, four photographs of Tennyson, one of which you see here. As you know, Tennyson was a very major poet of the Victorian period and uh, he grew up in a world or society of unprecedented change. It was a society that was undergoing rapid changes because of industrial revolution, because of the scientific discoveries and technology, because of colonization and also because, uh, uh, you know, of the changes in writing and perception of authors, avant-garde movements, etc. were also there. Uh, this was a world, Tennyson society was a world, or world was a world that was wandering between uh, two worlds, one dead and the powerless to be born, as Tennyson's uh, contemporary Arnold himself said. Uh, at this time, the problems of the working classes were beginning to be acknowledged. Uh, Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels were working for them and uh, there was the Great Reform Act. Tennyson himself was not really deeply concerned about his age in the sense uh, Arnold was. Uh, he did not, uh, probably, I, I shouldn't say he was not concerned. I should say he didn't write about his age very um, in an activist mode. Uh, that was a criticism that was like leveled against Tennyson also. Tennyson chose to very subtly uh, deal with these poems in some of his later, uh, to deal with these problems in some of his later poems like Maud, Locksley Hall, etc. Uh, so not all, you know, Maud and Locksley Hall are both not later poems, but still. Um, and uh, he also wrote about, because he was a poet laureate, he had to write about the age, the events of the age, such as the Crimean War, which he depicted in both Maud and the Charge of the Light Brigade. And he wrote about the uh, First War of Indian Independence, or what they called the Sepoy Mutiny of 1857. He wrote poems like The Defense of Lucknow, etc. So, uh, this po these poems that we have here also show Victorian spirit in different ways. Uh, the conflict of uh, religion and science and age of doubt Victorian period was. That is uh, depicted to some extent in Lotus Eaters. Uh, and the Victorian spirit of um, con uh, exploration and conquest and uh, knowledge, the quest for knowledge that you can see in Ulysses. Let us take a look at these poems now. First, we'll talk about The Lotus Eaters. It was published in the first collection, 1832 collection. Take a look at the composition of the poem. When Tennyson wrote The Lotus Eaters, he was only a little older than 20. And it appeared in his 1832 collection, which was severely criticized by critics and uh, he went into 10 years silence, as I told you. Like the Romantic poets who preceded him, Tennyson found much inspiration in the ancient worlds of Greece and Rome. He turned to the classical uh, li literature as well as classical way of life as a solace or a comfort from the uh, problems of the Victorian age. Now the poem from this period which was closely related to the Lotus Eaters is Ulysses. The poem is based on an episode in Book 9 of the Odyssey which is Homer's great epic poem. And uh, the Greek hero Odysseus and his company of men encountered many perils and visited strange lands during his voyage home after the Trojan War. There was a 10-year Trojan War after which Ulysses took like 10 years to reach home also because he was undergoing a lot of perils and adventures and he got imprisoned, he had to kill people, etc. In one of these lands lived people who consumed the edible parts of what is called the lotus flower. It is not exactly the lotus of India. Lotus was the Greek name for many plants containing substances from which narcotics could be made or extracted. So the lotus fruit or lotus uh, plant had a drugging effect. So the mariners eat, they are already weary from their journey and this weariness of the lotus eaters 
sorry, of the mariners, of Ulysses' mariners, can, can be compared to the exhaustion and weariness of the Victorians. And when they come to the lotus land and they see the lotus fruit and eat it, they decide that they don't want to go any further because they want to stay there, because they want to rest. So that is the theme of lotus eaters. After several crewmen ate the lotus, it induced in them a pleasant trance-like state of mind. And Odysseus or Ulysses finds the men, drags them back to the ships and ties them to the rowing benches. Because they are not ready to go, he had to uh, forcibly take them and tie them up. They resist his efforts, wishing to stay on. That is the mythology. All this tying up and everything are not there in the poem. I'm talking about the mythology of it, mythological side of it. With the help of the remaining sailors who did not eat the lotus fruit, uh, Odysseus quickly gets them away from the island. That is the actual story or the story that we hear from uh, mythological texts. Now, so what is the central idea of the poem? The poem is based on this mythological story. As the poem opens, we are thrown right into the action, like in an epic, uh, because it's modeled on an epic in media's rest, it begins. A crew of sailors is about to arrive in a new and strange country. They find a lazy tropical place full of, uh, you remember, this is also colonial, uh, orientalist. Uh, the, for the Westerner, uh, Orient is a place of laziness, of uh, lethargy, of uh, fun and uh, enjoyment. D did you understand? So this is an Orientalist image that you get here. They find a lazy tropical place full of streams and mountains and waterfalls. So India for the Westerner or Africa for the Westerner from an Orientalist perspective means natural resources, laziness, lethargy, uh, probably pleasures of the body. So not probably, certainly pleasures of the body. So that is the kind of feeling that uh, mariners are getting, Ulysses' mariners are getting in this tropical island. The natives are called the lotus eaters. They bring these mariners some of their favorite food, which is an enchanted plant called the lotus. They are always eating it and doing nothing. Some of the sailors try the lotus and it has a strange effect on them. The sailors try the lotus fruit and it has a strange effect on them. They make them it makes them sleepy and dazed and fills them with an unwillingness to act. It makes them uh, sleepy and gives them an unwillingness to act. They refuse to move, insisting that they are tired of working all the time and want to stay in this new place and they want to relax. They refuse to move. They say they want to relax. And the rest of the poem is taken up by the sailors talking about how tired they are and how even though they miss their families and their home, they do not want to sail anymore. They just want to live there in the colonial island, uh, make it a colony there. And uh, because they have this orientalist perception, they think that everything has changed at home. But we know that everything may not have changed because from Ulysses' story, we know Penelope was... Uh, you know, from the mythology, we know Penelope-like characters, uh, that is Agamemnon's wife, and uh, no, Ulysses' wife, Plen Agamemnon's wife is Clytemnestra. Uh, Penelope-like characters, uh, they weave their web and wait for their husbands. That is how Ulysses was welcomed home. He, she did not uh, cheat on him while he was away. But uh, the mariners are thinking that uh, the, everything must have changed at home. Uh, their wives, the sons and uh, their people may have all forgotten them. Finally, they decide to stay forever, relaxing and dreaming and eating the lotus fruit until the day they die. So they decide to stay there forever. Now, the structure of the poem. The poem is divided into two parts. The first section is lines 1 to 45. They are... Uh, uh, written in stanzas written in Spenserian stanza form. The first section consists of uh, stanzas written in the form of Spenserian stanza. And this is a descriptive narrative of the mariners reaching the land of the lotus eaters. And it's a drowsy world where everything is moving slowly and in a very picturesque manner, in a very visual manner, uh, Tennyson, which is characteristic of Tennyson. Tennyson describes to us how Nothing really seems to move in this land. 
the lotus eaters offer the enchanted fruit to the uh, marin weary mariners sorry not very mariners weary mariners the lotus eaters are giving this enchanted fruit to them and they eat it uh, and enter a dreamy state they become very drowsy and they can't uh, just go on with their journey anymore they sit on the sand and sing so the second part of the poem the second section is the song that they sing they don't have the desire to leave the second section is a choric song of eight numbered stanzas of varying length there are eight stanzas one two three four like that it is numbered and the stanzas have varying length and it is sung by the drugged mariners the stanzas alternate between their delight in a life of ease and their rejection of the past life of strife and action the stanzas alternate between their delight in a life of ease they want this life of ease and they are rejecting the past life of strife and action so what are the choric uh, stanzas about the uh, in the choric stanzas you will see that the odd numbered stanzas or the odd number not lines the odd numbered stanzas celebrate the drowsy effects of the fruits the fruit that they ate uh, have a drowsy effect that is described in the odd numbered stanza so let us take a look at one uh, the uh, content or the uh, theme of the choric stanzas one by one in the first stanza in the choric song they sing of the soft music on the island the Uh, soft music on the island is onomatopoeically uh, evoked in the lines itself in the language itself in the second stanza they ask why they should be weary and forced to toil everything in nature they say is happy and content everything is happy and content and uh, then in the fourth stanza they want to be left alone to attain the natural end of death if uh, death is the natural end of life why should life be full of toil they ask that question in the fifth stanza the dreamful ease of the mariners is further discussed and in the sixth stanza they say things have changed at home it is better to stay in the land of the lotus they decide in the seventh stanza and in the last eighth stanza they decide to remain there they uh, agree to remain there ignoring the sufferings of the outside world so that is a little problematic the mariners are ignoring the sufferings of the outside world that is a little problematic should you really do that um, the last stanza invites us to actually criticize the mariners for their choice now the first part of the poem is written in nine lined spenserian stanzas and describe the sailors arriving on the island eating the lotus and its immediate impact on them the uh, sailors are all arriving on the island they are eating the lotus and its immediate impact on them the rhyme scheme of the spenserian stanzas is a b a b b c b c c nine lines with the first eight lines in iambic pentameter and the final line in alexandrine the spenserian stanza creates a sense of calm unity and harmony uh, and a spenserian sensuousness tennyson uh, and keats both uh, were inspired by uh, spencer and tennyson uh, was inspired by keats and both of them were inspired by spencer in this poem lotus eaters you feel a spencerian air the choric song follows a far looser structure so in the first section of the poem which is in spencerian stanzas there is a strict structure because the nine lines are maintained and uh, the choric song is far looser because of varying uh, line uh, you know stanza lengths both the line length and the rhyme scheme vary widely among the eight stanzas why do you think that is because they have already eaten the lotus fruit in the first section and now their mind is out of control now they when they sing there is no uh, order to it there is no structure to it did you understand so it presents the confused thoughts and feelings of the sailors under the influence of the fruit 
Every stanza of the choric song presents a different argument to justify the mariner's resolution to remain in the lotus land. So every stanza moves slowly towards their resolution that they don't want to leave. The poem carries echoes of the biblical story of Adam in the book of Genesis. There are, sto uh, there, there are biblical echoes. Uh, and uh, directly it refers to the book of Genesis and the story of Adam. In the Bible, a life of toil is Adam's punishment for partaking of the fruit of the tree of knowledge. So Adam is punished to a life of toil. After succumbing to the temptation of this fruit, remember that is a fruit and this is also a fruit. So the lotus eaters are also eating a fruit. Adam is condemned to labor. Uh, sorry, here also. Uh, th th there is fruit. Now, Adam, after eating the fruit, is condemned to labor by the sweat of the brow. But in this poem, the fruit, which is lotus fruit, provides a release from the life of labor. It is like a uh, remedy for Adam's uh, punishment. <clears throat> The lotus fruit, the second fruit they are eating, uh, gives them a release from the life of labor, suggesting an inversion of the biblical story. The poem itself. Stanza 1. Courage, he said and pointed toward the land. The speaker who says courage is none other than Ulysses. Courage, he said and pointed toward the land. This mounting wave will roll us shoreward soon. In the afternoon they came unto a land in which it seemed always afternoon. All round the coast the languid air did swoon, breathing like one that hath a weary dream. Full faced above the valley stood the moon, and like a downward smoke the slender stream. Along the cliff to fall and pause and fall did seem. What is the impression that this uh, poem is creating for you? At first, it says courage. Wow, that is action. That is, uh, uh, you know, showing the other side of uh, eating the lotus fruit. From courage, suddenly the stanza, that excitement, that enthusiasm, that energy, the stanza is moving into a lot of lethargic, relaxed words. Look at this lang. Look at this uh, languid air, weary dream. Full faced above the valley stood the moon. It is stasis. It is not action. And like a downward smoke. Wow, how beautiful. Like it is going downward the smoke. Like a downward smoke. The slender stream. You can't even see the flow. It is so slow. Fall, pause, fall. Like that it is flowing. So these la the last part of the stanza is full of... Images of stasis. Did you understand? Let us take a look at the analysis of the stanza. The poem begins in media's rest with Ulysses' words, Courage! This mounting wave will roll us shoreward soon. Creating some excitement as the speaker and his friends seem to be approaching land after a voyage. From somewhere they are coming and landing in the lotus land. This initial word, courage, is not an iamb. Even though the first eight lines are supposed to be in iambic pentameter, courage is a trochee, which is, what is iamb? Iamb is unstressed followed by stressed. What is trochee? Stressed followed by unstressed. So, the first word is a trochee. And uh, why trochee? Lending energy and force to the exhortation. In stark contrast with the dreamy quality of the following lines. The following lines have a dreamy quality. The rest of the stanza creates a contrasting dull effect with words like languid air did swoon and weary dream. Did you understand? The air is compared to breathing like one that hath a weary dream. When you have a weary dream, your breathing is slow. Did you understand? That is why languid air. The third and fourth lines after afternoon. 
all the lines with afternoon what are the lines in the afternoon they came into a unto a land in which it always seemed afternoon what happens in afternoon in a cold countries when there is hot when there are hot afternoons they will sleep because they can't take the heat they will sleep in the afternoon so uh, the repetition of the word afternoon at the beginning and end of the third and fourth lines make the sailors seem like they are trapped there they are trapped they can't leave and the repetition of seemed several times in the entire poem there are several times tennyson is saying seemed in the poem that uh, stresses the unreality of what they see are they really seeing this or in their drugged state are they really imagining it the full moon looks down on the valley even though it is afternoon and the stream seems to fall and pause and fall from the cliff face not by any means a lively tripping rivulet but it is almost like a downward smoke it is like a downward smoke such a powerful picture of stasis without action let us come to the second stanza now a land of streams we now know what streams are they are slow and uh, you know like a picture a land of streams some like a downward smoke slow dropping veils of thinnest lawn lawn is a very thin kind of linen cloth imagine a very transparent veil slow dropping veils of thinnest lawn like that some streams are and some through wavering lights and shadows broke through the wavering lights of the land and shadows some streams are moving rolling a slumbrous sheet of foam below the sheet of foam that is below when they are uh flowing uh, flowing down uh, like a waterfall that sheet of foam is uh, slumbrous it is like deep sleep it is like the foam is in deep sleep slumbrous sheet of foam below they are rolling they saw the gleaming river seaward flow these mariners they saw the gleaming river seaward flow from the inner land far off three mountain tops three silent pinnacles of aged snow again uh, you know evoking uh, age history past and stasis three silent mountain tops three silent pinnacles of aged snow nothing is changing on the mountain top stood sunset flushed some light is there gleaming then sunset flushed and dewed with showery drops upclomb upclomb is the archaic past tense of upclimb so these uh, pinnacles or the mountain tops are standing flushed with sunset dewed with showery drops upclomb the shadowy pine above the woven copse copse is like a little wood and the shadowy pine it's a big pine tree is climbing above the copse it is shine, climbing above the uh, bushes you know the tree is overhanging uh, the copse it is climbing over oh my god it's a beautiful picturesque visual description which is highly characteristic of tennyson tennyson was very good at metrical verse and descriptive lines now like in the previous stanza there is a burst of excitement at the beginning a land of streams and an exclamation mark that is the excitement with the exclamation marks and the sashora allowing it to sink in a land of streams then sashora or pause then we are able to experience it that is why the pause is there but after that excitement there is na there is no more energy it is a land of streams and what do you see some streams are like downward smoke some are rolling a slumbrous sheet of foam so this downward smoke is repeating throughout the poem you can see such repetitions phrases words are repeated and this repetition is a technique that he uses uh, to create a sleep like slumbrous effect did you understand so it is a land of streams some like a downward smoke repetition and some rolling a slumbrous sheet of foam where they fall the assonance the use of sibilance 
and the word slumberous. So there are many uh, linguistic devices that he is using here. Alliteration, assonance and the use of sibilance and the word slumberous. All these bring out the dream-like state of the place. The place is dream-like and, uh, uh, you know, they are not in their rational senses. The people here, the lotus eaters as well as the mariners who are going to eat the fruit are not in the uh, uh, rational sense. They are uh, speaking as if they are not in control of their mind. Did you understand? Um, so, the, the language is creating the effect that the... Uh, the semantic effect that is created by language. Uh, the assonance, alliteration and the use of sibilance. What do you mean by sibilance? Sir sound, hissing sound. S -s Sir, what are the Sir sounds created in this uh, stanza? Streams, smoke, slow, uh, slumbrous, then silent, stood, sunset. So many Sir, Sir sounds are there. So... That is about uh, the language. They, the, the pronoun they. What is they? The unnamed group addressed at the beginning of the poem. Uh, courage, he said, and pointed toward the land. The, uh, in the afternoon, they came unto a land. It was said in the first stanza. That they is an unnamed group. They are brought in again and the landscape is described through their eyes. How is the landscape described as they see it? The gleaming river flowing towards the sea, the three peaks covered in aged snow and fresh dew bathed in sunset glow in the, and the single pine tree apparently climbing up the slope above the pine grove. It's a wonderful picturesque scenery. This personified description like tree is climbing, that is personification, uh, again stresses the strangeness of the place. Like in Kubla Khan, is this uh, an enchanted place? Is it a go go ghostly haunted place? You feel like in Kubla Khan. Now the third stanza, the charmed sunset lingered low adown in the red west through mountain clefts the dale was far seen far inland and the yellow down bordered with palm and many a winding vale and meadow set with slender galingale a land where all things always seemed the same and round about the keel with faces pale dark faces pale against that rosy flame the mild Eyed melancholy lotus eaters came. He's again describing the sunset. He's describing the dale. The dale means the valley. He's uh, describing the yellow down bordered with palm. He's uh, describing the flora and fauna of the place. The meadow, the winding valley, slender galingale. He's mentioning many plants and flowers here. And many of them have mythological significance also. <laughs> And then he's saying, after describing all this like a picture, he's saying this is a land where all things always seemed the same. Picturesque means like in a picture. And here he's describing also the whole scene like a picture that will not change. And round about the keel, keel means the uh, backbone of the ship, the main... Uh, the, the side of the ship. And there, what? who came with faces pale... Who came? The lotus eaters, the inhabitants of that land. Dark faces pale against that rosy flame. The mild-eyed, melancholy lotus eaters came. They, they have come to welcome the mariners. So the description of the land continues. The lingering, charmed sunset, the distant valley visible through, the cleft in the mountains, the yellow meadows bordered by the green trees and the winding valleys with exotic flowers. The same mysterious stillness clothes everything, shrouds everything. A land where all things always seemed the same. Nothing changes. There is a mysterious stillness. And then dramatically the lotus eaters come. But in keeping with the tempo of the poem the, and undercutting the excitement of their appearance, there is no excitement. Instead, he is saying their dark faces are pale and they are mild-eyed and melancholy. 
they are like uh, zombies because of their constant eating of the lotus fruit and throughout the stanza the repetition of la ma na sounds lull the readers too in a trance like state i had a very difficult time uh, making this powerpoint because i kept dozing off because of the la ma na sounds lingered low mountain dale seen inland yellow palm uh, then land seemed uh, slender same so many lamana sounds that lull you into sleep hello hello don't sleep we are in the middle of this poem so throughout the stanza the repetition of lamana sounds lull the readers to into a trance like state and the clever use of enjambment enjambment is run on lines the meaning does not end at the end of the line it runs on so it creates a sense of distance and vastness and sleepiness by suggesting the time taken uh, needed to take in this view you need a lot of time to look around and take in that feeling is created then stanza 4 branches they bore of that enchanted stem the lotus eaters are carrying branches of the lotus plant laden with flower and fruit whereof they gave to each everybody they gave this lotus fruit but who so did receive of them and taste whoever tasted it to him the gushing of the wave it is almost like eve eating the forbidden fruit what did they feel these mariners to him the gushing of the wave far far away did seem to moan and rave on alien shores as if his fellow spake if somebody spoke to them they felt like they are speaking from far away it is like they have smoked cannabis or something uh, they are feeling like they have been transported from this world and uh, the person standing next to them is seem, uh, seems to be far away it seems like the uh, next st the standing uh, the person standing next to them is speaking in a thin voice as if from the grave and deep asleep he seemed yet all awake even though they were awake they seemed like deep asleep and music in his ears his beating heart did make so this is the experience that they have of eating the lotus fruit the lotus eaters come laden with flower and fruit of the lotus plant that is the analysis in a scene with biblical echoes they offer the fruit to the sailors the effect is immediate immediately like when he ate the forbidden fruit they she felt something immediately like that the waves nearby seemed to moan and rave on alien shores and far away they are suddenly feeling the effect everything seems to move far away the voice of their companions seems frail and ghostly the beating of the heart becomes the music in their ears and they sink into a state between sleeping and waking in the first two lines what are the first two lines branches they bore of that enchanted stem laden with flower and fruit whereof they gave those two lines the iambic pentameter used throughout is broken to uh, begin uh, with a trochee branches is a trochee again like courage branches is a trochee so that the stress falls on the crucial words branches and laden Bo both these lines have trochee beginning branches and laden the former suggesting abundance and the latter the heaviness of spirit when you eat in abundance you feel heaviness of spirit did you understand that results from eating the fruit now they sat down this is the last stanza of the first section they sat them down upon the yellow sand the lotus eaters made the mariners sit down they sat them down upon the yellow sand between the sun and moon upon the shore and sweet it was to dream of fatherland of child and wife and slave but ever more they started dreaming of their fatherland but then they felt that everything in their fatherland must have changed they felt that they don't want to go back so they sat them down upon the yellow sand between the sun and moon upon the shore and sweet it was to dream of fatherland of child and wife and slave but ever more most weary seemed the sea weary the oar they can't bear to uh, row their boat and 
uh, reach their lands they can't row so they most weary seemed the sea weary the oar weary the wandering fields of barren foam see weary 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 it is repeated and this repetition of that word weary makes us even more weary then someone said we'll return no more and at and all at once they sang our island home is far beyond the wave will no longer roam they began to sing that they will not go home so after this stanza it is the actual choric song of the mariners eight stanzas are there now let us analyze the last stanza of the first section this stanza describes the effect of eating the lotus fruit on the sailors or mariners in greater detail the phrase that begins the first line they sat them down already shows that the simple action of sitting down has become difficult in this drug induced state they can't sit down themselves so somebody is making them sit down uh, and they are dreaming of their fatherland remember in the victorian period opium that came from china far away land of china like uh, this uh, lotus eaters land opium was a very very important uh, drug used by the victorians so this there are lots of subtle colonial references to the opium addiction of the victorians and how uh, people the westerners arrived on strange shores and they liked it and did not want to leave and how the whole uh, view of this land is orientalist did you understand now um, but it all but all is clouded with a melancholy when they think of their fatherland everything is clouded with a melancholy and but probably that is induced by the drug uh when they are in their senses they won't think of their fatherland like this i suppose so all is clouded with melancholy and the sea and the sailing and even the foam on the waves seem weary to the travelers the repetition of the word weary and alliteration and assonance convey the tiredness of the sailors in a subtle allusion to their far away island home the poet reminds us that these are not idle vagabonds but greek soldiers trying to go back after a war now they are not idle vagabonds they have a fatherland they have a wife and children and people to rule over and they are greek soldiers we are reminded and all at once they sang our island home is far beyond the wave we'll no longer roam this brings to an end the first section of the poem and the first section was written in nine lined uh, spenserian stanzas with a sharply followed rhyme scheme a b a b b c b c c now the choric song there is sweet music here that softer falls than petals from blown roses on the grass look at imagine close your eyes and listen to me imagine seeing this picture it is so picturesque there is sweet music here that softer falls it is onomatopoeic also you can hear uh, and see the picture you know the language the effect of the sounds creates the picture there is sweet music here that softer falls than petals from blown roses on the grass or night dews on still waters between walls of shadowy granite or night dews on still waters between walls of shadowy granite in a gleaming pass music that gentlier on the spirit lies instead of saying gentler he is saying gentlier that means even more gentle music than that gentlier on the spirit lies than tired eyelids upon tired eyes music that brings sweet sleep down from the blissful skies here are cool mosses deep he is leaving that music and in that music is created that scenery that tired music that soft music here in that music are cool mosses deep and through the moss the ivy creep all pictures of stillness and in the stream the long leaved flowers weep 
and from the craggy ledge the poppy hangs in sleep wow it is impossible to overcome the stanza and awaken myself and continue because i'm feeling so sleepy after this hey don't, don't sleep wake up wake up wake up we have to move on to the analysis <laughs> The following eight stanzas form the choric song of the sailors who do not want a life of toil anymore. The iambic pentameter and the regular rhyme scheme breaks down here. There is no more uh, strictly followed iambic pentameter or strictly followed stanzaic pattern. The lines are of varying length and uh, rhythms and rhymes are unpredictable. all reflecting the clouded minds of the sailors under the influence of the lotus fruit the calm narrator of the previous section has given way to multiple narrators speaking as one it is choric song but the mood and the tone keeps changing in line with the speaker's thoughts the mm -hmm. first seven lines onomatopically describe the soft music on the island that falls more softly than petals from a rose flower or night dews on still waters music that gentlier on the spirit lies than tired eyelids upon tired eyes <laughs> the last four exquisite lines combining evocative images and sounds once again vividly recreate the sleep inducing landscape around them the use of long vowels masterly employment of assonance mm. and the somnolent imagery all contribute to this effect mm -hmm. somnolent means inducing um inducing um sleep the reference to the drooping poppy is especially significant what is the reference to the drooping poppy and from the craggy ledge the poppy hangs in sleep the drooping poppy okay now um let us move on to the next stanza it is a longer stanza why are we weighed upon with heaviness and that totally consumed with sharp distress while all things else have rest from weariness all things have rest why should we toil alone we only toil who are the first of things and make perpetual moan still from one sorrow to another throne nor ever fold our wings and cease from wanderings nor steep our brows in slumbers holy balm nor hearken what the inner spirit sings there is no joy but calm why should we only toil the roof and crown of things this is a stanza that laments the tedium of life why are we weighed down with heaviness in the victorian pe period people will understand this easily because they were all weighed down with heaviness utterly consumed with sharp distress everything in this world have rest from distress except us human beings all things have rest why should we toil alone we who are the first of things now he is referring to the biblical adam and eve also now now we there is a direct connection we know he is referring to that also and make perpetual moan we are constantly crying and complaining still from one sorrow to another throne nor ever fold our wings and cease from wanderings we have no rest from our sorrows and wanderings nor steep our bro brows in slumbers holy balm we can't sleep properly we can't hearken to the inner spirit our inner spirit says what you need is calmness peace of mind is the best joy the only joy that we don't have because we have to make money we have to do this do that we are going from uh, heaviness to distress the fret and fever of modernity the mariners are asking why should we only toil the roof and crown of things 
Let us look at the analysis. Now starts the sailor's complaints about the human condition. When all other creatures can rest, why should man alone toil and struggle all his life? Our spirit craves for peace or calmness, but our lives are full of turmoil. Man is the first of creation, and yet his lot seems the worst because we alone cannot fold our wings and cease from wanderings and are from one sorrow to another thrown. The sailor's rhetorical questions, of course, are not completely valid. But remember, they are in a hallucinatory state. They are not in their senses. Logic is driven by self-pity. The regular metrical structure of the previous stanzas fall apart in the confused anguish of their clouded mind. Now the third stanza, Lo, in the middle of the wood, the folded leaf is wooed from out the bud. The leaves are also breaking out. The leaves were folded into a bud. Now they are coming out with winds upon the branch and there grows green and broad and takes no care. Sun steeped at noon and in the moon nightly dew fed and turning yellow falls and floats down the air. Wow. He is describing again so picturesquely. You know, and uh, he's describing a leaf. The folded leaf is wooed out from the bud and then it grows green and broad. The leaf becomes broad. It becomes sun steeped at noon. In the night, the leaf is fed by dew, turns yellow and then falls. Lo, sweetened with the summer light, the full juiced apple. First here he talked about the leaf. Here he talks about the apple. The full juiced apple, waxing over mellow, drops in a silent autumn night. All its allotted length of days, the flower ripens in its place. Everything ripens and fades and falls, and hath no toil. It just stands there, rests, without doing anything, it falls, fast rooted in the fruitful soil. It is about how death is natural for everything. And nothing has toil except man. Beautiful, isn't it? Let us look at the analysis. They look around and see all nature effortlessly ripen, fade and fall wherever they grow. He is preferring a natural life against the science and technology. He is preferring a natural life against the fret and fever of modernity. Na na nature versus science, technology and uh, materialism. So that is the theme here. Uh, the sailors are saying, look at nature. There is no toil there. There is so much calm there. And everything lives and falls and dies so naturally, except man. When they look around and see all nature effortlessly ripen, fade and fall wherever they grow, unlike the sailors who have been wandering for many years and undergoing all sorts of turmoil. The leaf is wooed out by the bud, by the wind like a lover, then grows broad and green on the branch, fed by moon and sun. And then it turns yellow, just floats down the wind. So easy the life of a leaf. What about the ripened apple? Sweetened by the summer, it falls silently in the autumn night. So much easy its life is. The flower stays fast rooted in its soil and blooms and fades and falls without any toil. The repetition of the word ripen and the alliteration and assonance convey the contentment of the sailors in that land. Everywhere there is contentment. Why does man alone have to roam and toil and strive? He doesn't understand. Now the choric song, stanza number four. <laughs> Hateful is the dark blue sky, vaulted over the dark blue sea. He's talking about the dark blue sky that is vaulted over the dark blue sea. Vaulted, vault is for Westerners, uh, referring to grave. And suddenly he's coming to the theme of death. Death is the end of life. Ah, why should life all labor be? Let us alone. Time driveth onward fast. And in a little while our lips are dumb. 
Let us alone. What is it that will last? Let us alone. Nothing lasts. Why should you toil now? Anyway, we have to die. All things are taken from us and become portions and parcels of the dreadful past. Let us alone. What pleasure can we have to war with evil? Is there any peace in ever climbing up the climbing wave? All things have rest and ripen toward the grave. In silence ripen, fall and cease. Give us long rest or death, dark death or dreamful ease. This whole stanza is about death. They are in love with death. Anyway, we are going to die. Let us eat this lotus fruit and rest here and die. Let us alone. Why should we struggle in this life? He is asking. They are asking. The sailors continue their complaining. Denoted by the predominance of harsher sounds in this stanza. Of plosives. Per, ter, ker, ber, der, ger. Plosives. And stops. Which obstruct smooth flow of words. Earlier in one stanza there were sibil sibilant sounds. That means sir, zer sounds. Now uh, another time we had sleep inducing le, mer, ne sounds. Now we have harsher sounds because they are complaining. The blue sea and the blue sky, so much a part of their life all these years, seem repugnant now. The epithet dark repeated twice and the word vaulted with its associations of the grave naturally lead to thoughts of death. Since death is anyway the end of life, why should we struggle through life? Nothing lasts, becoming portions and parcels of the past sooner or later. The thrice repeated, let us alone, let us alone, let us alone, three times he said in that stanza, with the seshura for curt insistence and the crisp rhetorical questions lead to the sad, languorous line at the end of the stanza. Give us long rest or death, dark death or dreamful ease leaving no doubt about their lack of the will to live. They don't have the will to live. They just want to cease to exist. After some time, sometime 55, 50 years after this, Sigmund Freud would talk about Thanatos, Eros and Thanatos. The death drive, that is what you see in Lotus Eaters. In Ulysses, what you see is Eros or the life drive. That is why they are companion poems, Eros and Thanatos. Tennyson wrote this 50 years before, almost 50 years before. Sigmund Freud talked about it. Now, Choric Song stanza 5. How sweet it were hearing the downward stream. All streams go downward. Why should he say downward stream? No, I mean, no, some streams go horizontal. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> downward stream reminds us of the downward smoke. And also, it reminds us of slow motion. How sweet it were hearing the downward stream with half-shut eyes ever to seem falling asleep in a half-dream. To dream and dream like yonder amber light which will not leave the mirror bush on the height to hear each other's whispered speech eating the lotus day by day to watch the crisping ripples on the beach and tender curving lines of creamy spray to lend our hearts and spirits wholly to the influence of mild-minded melancholy to, mu mu to muse and brood and live again in memory with those old faces of our infancy heaped over with a mound of grass Two handfuls of white dust shut in an urn of brass. Again, they are talking about death. They talk about dreaming, day by day eating and becoming melancholy. And they are talking about dead people from their infancy. Let us look at the analysis. The sailors expand on the dreamful ease of the previous stanza. They wish to live in a permanent half dream, like the sunset glow which does not leave the mirror bush on the mountain, listening to each other's whispered speech, idly watching the 
crisping ripples on the beach and tender curving lines of creamy spray brooding over the past and remembering the loved ones of their infancy very idle melancholic moments but they have all become just a few handfuls of dust in an urn all those people they knew in the past are all dead and become handfuls of dust the sailors wish to surrender themselves wholly to mild minded melancholy they want to surrender to mild minded melancholy the two lines in the middle of the stanza dwelling on the beauty of the waves breaking on the beach create a feeling that they are not completely lost to the real world the two lines in the middle of the stanza dwelling on the beauty of the waves do you remember those lines um to watch the crisping ripples on the beach and tender curving lines of creamy spray that those are the lines now but the moment passes and their loved ones are all dead there is no reason to return to reality now sixth stanza dear is the memory of our wedded lives they are remembering again their past people the dear and dear the last embraces of our wives um and their warm tears how they cried when uh, they left they are remembering and uh, then they are thinking that everything would be changed now so and dear the last embraces of our wives and their warm tears but all hath suffered change for surely now our household hearts are cold our sons inherit us our looks are strange and we should come like ghosts to trouble joy or else the island princes overbold have eat our substance and the minstrel sings before them of the 10 years war in troy and our great deeds are as half forgotten things they are thinking that all the great things they did must be forgotten now is there confusion in the little isle let what is broken so remain why should we go back there this idea is there in enoch arden by um, tennyson tennyson's uh, enoch arden shows a, a sailor who is supposed to have long lost at sea when he comes back home he sees that his wife has taken another husband she has remarried so the uh, sailor goes away quietly so like that the uh, lotus eaters are feeling why should we go back because we must be forgotten there let what is broken so remain the gods are hard to reconcile it is hard to settle order once again there is confusion worse than death trouble on trouble pain on pain long labor unto aged breath sore task to hearts worn out by many wars and eyes grown dim with gazing on the pilot stars he is talking about they are talking about how worn out uh, they must be and life is such a pain the thoughts of the old faces of their infancy bring back thoughts of their home their wives and children they cherish those memories but feel that they all must have changed back home for they have been away for many many years now now their household hearts are cold that means unloving for them and their ghost like return will only disturb the family making the first reference to their past adventures the sailors say that their 10 year war with troy and their great exploits have become just half forgotten tales sung by minstrels they don't seem real anymore however contrary to their expectations we know that penelope's world is one of fidelity and duty remember at this time a lot of uh, british people were living in the colonies like this they were exploring and they lived there so many people can identify with the feeling of the lotus eaters uh, because they are uh, many times they are separated from their families who are back in england and uh, they are longing for homeland and fear that things would change back home things like that with the same disinterested and ap- apathy shown earlier the sailors say uh, they do not care if the land is in trouble for it is not easy to placate the gods 
and they are worn out by many wars and long voyages all such strife seems fruitless now it is like it is is also a metaphor for old age youth is what is strife old age is uh, this resignation that you can't any more fight that kind of feeling and stanza 7 this is the this is the penultimate stanza only one more stanza is there but propped on beds of amaranth and molly these are mythic uh, plants that that are supposed to induce sleep i think how sweet su- uh, wait amaranth and molly i have oh nothing is given there okay how sweet while warm airs lalas blowing lowly remember it is afternoon with half drop dilated still beneath a heaven dark and holy to watch the long bright river drawing slowly his waters from the purple hill to hear the dewy echoes calling from cave to cave through the thick twined vine to watch the emerald colored water falling through many a woven acanthus wreath divine acanthus is another plant important in mythology only to hear and see the far off sparkling brine only to hear were sweet stretched out beneath the pine so they are again uh, praising the effect of the lotus fruit to lie propped on beds of amaranth with half drooped eyelids you know how to experience the effect of the flower on the other hand how sweet it is to recline on beds of flowers of amaranth and molly under a dark and holy sky and half awake watch the long bright river fill with water and hear the sounds of the dew drops echoing through the caves and see the emerald colored water falling through acanthus wreaths how peaceful just to hear the sounds of the far off sparkling sea stretched out beneath the pine trees and flowers mentioned are all legendary flowers which greeks believed had divine properties the still silence of the land is such that even dewy echoes are audible the sea which had seemed vaulted earlier is now the sparkling brine the sea had a vault of the uh, uh, the, the sky above it now it is called sparkling brine as they have decided to stay, stay and not sail um the lotus this is the last stanza the lotus blooms below the barren peak the lotus blue blows by every winding creek all day the wind breathes low with mellower tone through every hollow cave and alley lone round and round the spicy downs the yellow lotus dust is blown we have had enough of action and of motion we rolled to starboard rolled to larboard when the surge was seething free rolled to starboard rolled to larboard look at the difficulty of the words where the wallowing monster spouted his foam fountains in the sea let us swear an oath and keep it with an equal mind we don't want to go into that ocean any more let us swear an oath to keep with an equal mind unanimously let us decide in the hollow lotus land to live and lie reclined on the hills like gods together careless of mankind how gods are careless of mankind there are two things here he is saying that the lotus eaters chose to be careless of mankind which is attracting our criticism and he is also saying that gods are careless of mankind he is lamenting that gods are not putting things right in victorian period it it is like a god forsaken country where gods are lying careless of mankind for they lie beside their nectar and the balls are hurled far below them in the valleys and the clouds are lightly curled round their golden houses girdled with the gleaming world he, he is um explaining how the gods lie they lie beside their nectar that is the drink of the gods and bolts are heard lightning bolts far below them in the valleys they don't care they will just send lightning bolts to the earth 
and clouds are lightly curled around their golden houses. Don't think this is the end of that stanza. One more uh, slide is there. Where they smile in secret, looking over wasted lands. Oh, the gods are bringing such misery upon earth. They are looking over wasted lands, such pessimism. Such pessimism. Blight and famine, plague and earthquake. This is what gods give us. Roaring deeps and fiery sands, clanging fists and flaming towns and sinking ships and praying hands. He is describing the suffering of the people. But they smile. The gods smile. They find a music centered in a doleful song, steaming up a lamentation and an ancient tale of wrong. Like a tale of little meaning, though the words are strong, chanted from an ill-used race of men that cleave the soil. Sow the seed while the men are struggling. They are singing. They cleave the soil, sow the seed, reap the harvest with enduring toil. Storing yearly little dews of wheat and wine and oil. Till they perish and suffer. And they suffer. Some, tis whispered, down in hell. Suffer endless anguish. Some human beings suffer endlessly. While others are in Elysian valleys. Elysian valleys means uh, the valley where uh, they will get salvation. When the blessed people die, they go to Elysian valleys. And some are suffering. Uh, and uh, some are in Elysian valley. Then, resting weary limbs at last on beds of asphodel. Again, another plant. Surely, surely, slumber is more sweet than toil. The shore than labor in the deep mild, in the deep mid-ocean. The shore is better than labor in the deep mid-ocean. Wind and wave and oar is better. Uh, sorry, is bad. We don't want that anymore. We want the shore. Oh, rest, ye brother mariners, we will not wander more. That is the end of the last stanza. The long last stanza begins with the sailors singing their praise of the lotus land. The first four lines with their incantatory rhythm. The first four lines have an incantatory rhythm. And it culminates in the long fifth line with its rhymes and half rhymes. It creates a mental picture of the sailors on the verge of intoxication. In the next three lines, the pace picks up and the harsh R sounds clash with the S sound to evoke the sailors' trustful life on the roaring, wa sorry, rolling waters. Remember the uh, stressful lines that I pointed out to you? Uh, what are they? What are they? What are they? I'm checking it out. Uh, where is it? Uh, ha! Rolled to starboard, rolled to larboard when the surge was seething free. That line. And then the rhythmic movement of the lines seemed to reflect the swaying from sound to sound of the hapless vessel at the mercy of the choppy seas. If you, when you read it aloud, you feel a swaying uh, in the lines. Tennyson similarly creates a marching rhythm with words in the charge of the light brigade also. There is a shift in the thought now when the sailors declare their desire to live with gods in lotus land, careless of mankind. This invites the readers to be critical of the mariners for evading their duty. The uh, mariners are evading their duty and they are say, saying it is okay to be careless of mankind. What follows is a long litany of complaints against the way the gods behave because they don't care about human beings. Expanding on the phrase careless of mankind. The gods delight in bringing destruction on humanity and smile in secret, watching all the calamities and hearing the lamentations and prayers. Blight and famine, plague and earthquake, roaring deeps and fiery, sa fiery sands, clanging fists and flaming towns and sinking ships and praying hands. 
two lines of brilliant assonance and alliteration where Tennyson's artist, artistry sums up the tribulations of human life. Tennyson, using his words, creates a beautiful uh, picture of the trials and sufferings of human life. Ending with the plaintive and praying hands, all of them, according to the sailors, treated with the same casualness by the gods. Mankind is an ill-used race. That cleave the soil, sow the seed, reap the harvest with enduring toil, only to perish at the end. Even after death, there is suffering in hell for most, while a few live in Elysian fields resting on beds of asphodel. The sailors' thoughts have come full circle, and naturally they conclude that a life of slumber in this Elysian island is infinitely better than the life of toil all mankind has to endure. And they will wander no more, they decide. So that brings us to the end of the analysis. Now we have to talk about the themes. Hi, now about the themes of the Lotus Eaters. A very important theme is the conflict between social responsibility and aesthetic de detachment. This was a very relevant topic or theme in the Victorian period. There were the people who argued that art is for life's sake. Ruskin and Arnold argued that art is for life's sake. In Tennyson's time also it had begun. And then emerged the people who believed that art for art's sake. That means uh, that art is for art's sake means you don't need to have a social responsibility. You can have aesthetic detachment. So how far uh, can you be aesthetically detached. How far can you shirk your responsibilities? Things like that were hotly debated in the Victorian period. And this uh, poem is on that theme. This theme is explored in other poems of Tennyson like The Palace of Art and The Lady of Charlotte as well. The Victorian consciousness represented a never-ending struggle for achievements in the physical world. That is what you see in the companion poem, Ulysses. The poem was published in the year of the Great Reform Act and it was a time when Victorian England was witnessing massive changes and riots, the Chartist movement and protests against uh, corn laws to name a few. There were many uh, working class people who were taking to the streets in protest at this time and there was so much trouble and trauma that led to these protests also. The poor working classes struggled and suffered a lot and it was a time of anxiety and exhaustion. So this poem evokes a natural existence dating back to classical times. Nature versus science and materialism. That theme is very much predominant here. A natural existence is uh, exalted above the life of science and materialism here. Evoking a natural existence dating back to classical times, Tennyson is refuting the struggles of modernity against modernity and materialism, against the science and achievements and exploits. Uh, this poem expresses a desire to escape and rest, that which is uh, regarded as more natural in the poem. The poem is an, also an expression of doubt which characterized Victorian dilemma. Should we? Do we really need all this progress? Do we need this science? Do we need uh, these uh, struggles and exploits? That is an expression of doubt and it characterized Victorian dilemma. Now Tennyson was a poet who did not deal with socio-political themes very much, very directly. That was not his main concern. Uh, that was also a criticism leveled against Tennyson. But subtly, Victorian dilemma is very much there in this poem, The Lotus Eaters. Tennyson himself battled alcoholism and pessimism. So remember, uh, Lotus Eaters are battling uh, uh, drug addiction. They are uh, addicted to the lotus fruit and it is like alcoholism. Tennyson and his brother were both uh, people who battled alcoholism and pessimism, which formed the major themes of the poem. Uh, and what is wrong with alcoholism and pessimism? It is a kind of justification. And also underlying this theme, there is a, underlying this poem, there is a colonial theme. The uh, people, uh, the mariners are going and living in a land and finding it conducive uh, to rest and they want to settle down there. 
this is what colonialism is this is how colonization started and how what will happen to the lotus eaters once the mariners live there you know it is like taken for granted that you can go and live in any land you want and the perspective of the uh, lotus eaters the you know the whole culture of the lotus eaters is an orientalist culture uh, associated with lethargy and rest and sensuality rather than uh, progress and physical life and there is also the very strong inversion of the biblical theme here the biblical theme asserts uh, the importance of keeping away from these forbidden fruits and uh, a life of toil is exalted here but in this poem you can see that there is an indulging in eating the fruit i am reminded of another pre raphaelite poem of christina rossetti called goblin market where two girls are eating a fruit uh, indulging in a eating and eating a fruit eating the fruit is also a metaphor for sensuality remember Tennyson was a very major influence on the pre-Raphaelites. Christina Rossetti and her brother D.J. Rossetti were influenced by Tennyson. So uh, these people uh, explored religion in new ways. You can see that in D.J. Rossetti's Blessed Damsel also. So this theme uh, is also very pertinent, the inversion of the Bible theme. That uh, brings us to the end of the discussion on Lotus Eaters. I hope you enjoyed.